There we go. Sorry for all that technical. Welcome, Mr. Flora. <laughs> All right, we're ready for your exciting presentation. You need elevated music or anything? <laughs> I get it to go backwards. There we go. Okay, All right. technical issues. So uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. I am Tim Flora, I'm your Director of Finance. Uh, I, I sort of feel like uh, I am the uh, opening act for a pretty big budget event today. And more importantly, I sort of feel like I'm the warm-up act for the common class presentation, which comes after me. Uh, so today we are going to talk about the general obligation bond referendum. Um, uh, and so if you remember, uh, we presented uh, at the budget retreat on March 1st, um, some potential projects for a proposed a geo general obligation bonds referendum. And so since then, uh, we've had the opportunity to go back and sort of refine our numbers, uh, um, gather additional information and come up with a, a presentation for you all of sort of what we deem as something that would be very appropriate for a geo referendum. Um, and part of that discussion today is uh, to get to gauge your interest if that is what you want to do, because if that is your interest, then we need to jump on it pretty quickly as we would need to introduce something at the May 20th um, uh, council meeting in order to get uh, the ball rolling. So, so what is a general obligation bond referendum? So uh, as we stated at the uh, budget retreat, it is sort of the primary source of funding for many infrastructure projects. So the big capital items, the very costly projects, um, Geo bonds really are the most common uh, funding source that we use for those types of projects, uh, particularly because those are uh, using the least expensive debt we have because we are a triple uh, A rated agency. Uh, and so, so could we you, get, could you repeat that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so general obligation bonds uh, are the primary source. The credit of rating part. The, the, yes, the credit rating part is we are a triple A uh, rated credit. That's uh, uh, we have a triple A credit rating on our general obligation bonds. And so that means that we get uh, the most, uh, um, the lowest interest rates on the debt we issue uh, for that debt. And so, uh, and that is because uh, that debt is secured by the full faith and credit of, of the city's taxing authority. So that is our ability to um, secure that debt by uh, the ability to uh, impose uh, um, tax revenue apply towards that. Uh, I will also point out that, uh, you know, you cannot use operating funds for any capital purchase. And so it, it really is for capital. And so if there's any associated capital with running uh, or operating costs associated with that capital, that is something that would have to be uh, addressed through an, a, an operating budget. So each referendum requires um, separate bond orders. And so at the presentation we made to you before, we sort of gave you one big number. Um, and in this presentation, uh, after talking with uh, our bond council, uh, really what we do is uh, we break it up into um, um, sort of different orders that we would present to uh, the voters. And so based upon uh, our assessment, uh, the projects, we, we sort of break it up into two different bond orders. In this situation, that would be for uh, parks, uh, would be one bond order, and the other bond order would be streets and sidewalks. And so um, I will point out, um, Council Member Cook, I'm so sorry. One of the things I did not reference in any presentation in the staff memo or uh, in the presentation was the general statute that applies to this. It is the Local Government Bond Act. Uh, uh, and it is the uh, North Carolina General Statute, Chapter 159, Article 4. Uh, so there are very specific guidelines and rules and laws that we use in order for this process. And so everything that I'm talking about today is certainly uh, consistent with, uh, with, with that uh, law. So uh, what, I'm, what you see here, these are the projects that we presented to you at the May 1 um, budget, count, budget retreat, council retreat 
oh, March 1, I'm sorry, the March 1st uh, council retreat. Um, and so that price tag was uh, $610 million. You'll notice that there's four categories there, sidewalks. And I will point out that the sidewalks in that presentation were the new sidewalks projects um, and then carbon neutral, neutral sustainability projects, the parks, and then the convention center. What we have refined uh, into the two bond orders is somewhat different. Um, the first is the bond order one, which is the parks and recreation uh, splash and pay project. So that's the two projects, uh, park projects that were presented uh, at the at the uh, budget retreat, uh, the former Wills Fun Park, and then uh, the other was the East End Long Meadows Park, the Austin Avenue Park facilities. Um, so that is a total of $85 million. And then different for bond order two for the streets and sidewalk, you'll see the first item there is the new sidewalk projects. That's $60 million. But because of the parameters uh, that we were looking at and the scope of what we're trying to do as far as... Uh, so one of the things for... Uh, geo bond referendum is you really want to, it's it's improving the quality of life for your residents. And so we thought by adding not only the new projects, the new sidewalk projects, which is very specific areas, but also we would supplement the funding that we have for the street paving and maintenance and supplement some of the sidewalk repairs payment because it addresses, you know, potholes and sidewalk repairs across, across the total city. Um, and so that we added that. And then as well, um, I think back in 2019, there was the Unpaved Roads Project, which we have been funding uh, every year for, the, I think the last couple of years, it's been $1.2 million. Um, I think I think at the time when that passed, I think council was looking to get all of our unpaved roads completed in a 10 year time frame. Um, we thought the Unpaved Roads Project, uh, uh, um, $10 million of funding for that in this um, would also sort of serve well because those unpaved roads are throughout throughout the city. And so all this really was, is doing is we would be moving it to this sort of funding, which is sort of what I would consider the less expensive funding, um, and then free up capacity in our regular CIP process. So what I'm gonna do is, so this is the high overview. We have, I do have in the presentation, sort of more specifics on each of the different projects we've talked about. A lot of this is information that you've already seen at the budget retreat. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but if there are specific questions about the projects, I do have uh, the uh, um, departments here that, that put together that information here to answer specific projects. But so on a very high level though, uh, the former Wills Fun Park, um, which would include the large outdoor aquatic center um, and uh, preserve uh, the Wills Fun uh, indoor skating rink, which all that is, is, is complete, but all of the park, Areas surrounding that. That project was $43 million. The East End Long Meadow Pool Parks that we're projecting. And when I say, when I'm giving you these costs, that is the cost of uh, um, design um, as well as, as construction. So those are, that's the total. Hopefully, that is the not to exceed uh, cost of those projects. Um, but at this point, those are um, our best guess uh, numbers. And that would be uh, uh, the Central Community Plaza retained existing that the athletic courts and fields, as well as uh, a potential pool um, at the uh, East End Park. So those two projects are bond order one, moving to um, bond order two, the streets and sidewalks. So these are the new sidewalk projects. Uh, what we did is we just took um, 11 of the most project ready uh, uh, projects that were there uh, to fund those. Um, you're looking at a you know, 25 unique sidewalk corridors and gaps. Uh, gaps. Uh, we're looking at like 12.4 miles worth of uh, sidewalks. Um, this is in addition to additional funding that we already have. We already have, I think, $38.6 million of federal funding that goes with that. And current funding that we already have at current funding levels is, is $12.4 million. Uh, this is just a list of those projects. Um, you'll note that, that I've got it capped at $60 million. Um, I think the estimated from the, the the department was like $62 million, but those are escalation costs. If those if it goes over that, we certainly have other revenue streams that we could make up, but but we thought the $60 million was a was a good number for that. The sidewalk and repairs and the street paving and maintenance, again, really the number we we have for that, that is 50% of the next three years of CIP funding that we have uh, programmed in. 
Um, and so we just really are, are pulling uh, pulling that out to supplement the funding that we have. Um, really, uh, that is just really to help free up capacity for uh, the ever increasing CIP uh, requests that we have. We're getting to the point with escalation cost and our growth and the, the number of projects. Um, what we currently have in our CIP, it's, it's hard to cover all of those projects. In fact, I think um, what we are still going through, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like we have 85 uh, projects in the CIP list right now. Right now, we, we are looking at only being able to fund uh, just a partial, uh, uh, I think, um, about 50, 50 projects of that. So really, with a geo bond referendum, what it does is it just frees up capacity in our regular CIP process um, so we can we can get those funded. And so this is just partial funding. I just want to make sure I was clear about that. This is just partial funding of, per, of current funding that we're already doing. And then here's the un, unpaved road project, which is which is new, which was not mentioned in the other. It, again, it's just a matter of uh, this, this project fit nicely into um, a geo referendum packet. Um, and just in the fact that um, we're, we're still shy, I think, um, we still have about 13 miles of unpaved uh, roads um, that we like. We would like to get paved. And this $10 million, while it may not uh, cover the entire cost of, of getting all these roads paved, it would be a bigger chunk and get us closer to uh, obtaining that goal. So the part I like uh, now is the financial impact. <laughs> um, uh, and so it does have an impact. And what we're looking at doing is this would be a $200 million uh, uh, referendum. If passed, we would issue that in two tranches. We, we don't need all that money in one big swoop. So we would split it up into over the course of the next couple of years, we would, we would actually go out and issue the debt in, in two tranches. And so uh, to do that, uh, uh, this is just sort of the uh, debt schedule that you would see. And so the average annual debt service would be to the tune of $14 million a year on that. That's just the average. I, I think you'll see it peaks at $20 million in one year. And so, that, but I do want to point out that this is what you're seeing here is based upon a 20 year um, um, payback schedule, which is, which is standard level principal payments, but at an interest rate of 5.34%. And, and that is that 5.3 percent is only here for illustrative purposes because the General Assembly um, changed the way uh, reporting requires are, and so we have to report the interest rate at the highest interest rate I think of of any geo issuance, um, and so our rate is more like I think would be more like 3.6 percent interest. So. Um, and that is the, the, the positive of having a AAA credit rating is um, there are some governments out there that are paying 5.34% because of our AAA credit uh, rating. Uh, we are anticipating it being at 5.34%. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, that is a big debt service uh, impact um, with the average being 14.2 million. And again, the highest uh, would be uh, 20, 20 million dollars. This is just a revision of a chart that we showed you at the um, budget retreat. Uh, what it shows is in the blue is our existing debt service. And so you can see uh, what uh, $31 million this year, um, and it, it, it goes up next year and then starts uh, to decline um, as, we, as we pay off that debt. The yellow is the debt service that is anticipated for the uh, $95 million housing bond geo bond that we've got. Um, we are issuing our first round of uh, debt uh, currently. It's in process, but we hope to close on it um, in the next month or so. Um, and so there will be that debt service layered in. And then what you see in the red would be the additional debt service that would result from uh, the $200 million bond referendum we have here that I'm talking about today. So financial impact uh, and talking about the tax rate implications. And so what this schedule sort of shows you is what is that impact 
on the tax rate. And so the average tax rate, if you average all of it, is 2.51%, but the immediate impact on tax rate would be 3.45 cents on the tax rate, and that would impact in FY26. Um, really no way to sugarcoat um, that. That is, um, and, and again, uh, this would be at its highest because this is based upon that 5.34% interest. Uh, we do anticipate, fully anticipate um, it being uh, lower, but you are in the ballpark with, with these numbers. And so really how we, how you see that declining because we make level principal payments. So the level principal payments are not like a house mortgage where you're making a level debt payment. How we work our debt over the 20 years, you make a level principal payment, which then means your interest rate, your interest costs decrease um, over a period of time because you're paying more of that principal up front. But the goal in this schedule really is you're looking at that far right column to see well, you don't want that column to go negative because you want to make sure that we have enough revenue to pay for our debt service. And But as you, as you see, as you go down that second column, the property tax rate, you can see over time, we in re, in reality, we could decrease that tax rate impact um, as we are paying down the debt. So this is where it gets us to. Um, and I do want to sort of back up just a little bit and saying, you know, there were, we, we pulled out the sustainability projects, we pulled out the convention center. That was not a value judgment on my part. That really is just a matter of project readiness. And um, what we put together really were those projects that we could start funding sort of immediately um, and were most appropriate to fit um, what we were trying to accomplish. Um, sustainability pro projects are not a specific project outlined by the general statute. It's not that we couldn't do them. It just it would just involve a whole lot more work as we had to tie them to other projects that that were and so so again no value judgment on what how we got to the projects we got to other than the fact that those were the most appropriate for this funding strategy. So now funding options and this is where we really need your input. It's you know we could do the referendum as uh, proposed or we could do it with changes. Um, we could not do a referendum. That's certainly an option. Um, it will just impact how we work our CIP uh, projects. And so there may be some that might could be delayed or even not funded at all. Um, we could um, put the referendum in a future year. That is certainly an option. Um, the only threat we run with that is just with the ever increasing escalation cost. Um, you know, projects are not gonna get any less expensive. I mean, I, I just do not see they're they are going. So if we delay it, you always have uh, the threat that next time I come back, these same projects, it, it, it's going to be at a higher at a higher number um, or no referendum at all. And we could continue to work through our CIP process and we could show you what that cost through the CIP process is in order to get more projects funded. We, we really kind of get to the same uh, end result, though, is it, it probably most likely would require a tax rate increase. And so with that, we can leave it here. Um, uh, I think my next slide really is just more, um, what would you like, how would you like us to move forward? What, what, answers, um, what answers to your questions can we provide? Where can I clarify any information? All right, um, Ellie. It seems like the um, equity, the green, and the sustainability have all been removed. So no, that would. So I really was trying to just stay focused on the funding piece altogether. I think there is an equity component to almost every project that we have, um, and that has worked through. Uh, and one of the things that I guess I, I I could have highlighted a little bit more was. Um, like for the new sidewalks and the row pavement, those ranked highest in the um, the CIP process. Those were two of the top three projects uh, that had the highest equity score. And so, so everything that is in this project, I think, addresses um, any equity and many green um, aspects of what we're doing. It just, I, I was very just very specific to the 
the, the financing piece of it. I hear that. I appreciate it. I think what I'm most concerned about, and, and it's mainly just even coming from the presentation yesterday, um, the way that things are going right now, um, with construction being the jobs that get created and only construction, essentially what happens is the people who do the construction end up being the moved out of the community. And so as folks continue to be priced out of our community and we're not, I mean, if we're not gonna create anything that essentially creates more jobs moving forward beyond the construction, which is the roads, streets, I mean, I'd like to think that Parks and Recs, you know, 365 days a year, that would create a whole lot of jobs, but I don't think so. And I'm disappointed, I should say. And um, I'm look to my colleagues, but yeah, that's all. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I just want to appreciate staff. Um, I think that this is uh, a great step. I think, you know, I think probably a lot of us probably got sticker shock at the budget retreat. We're like, I don't think we're ready for $610 million. And I didn't think y'all were promoting that. I just, you were trying to give us options. And so I think based on conversations of what are good fiscal policies around what we do with limited obligation bonds versus uh, whatever, the go bonds and, Geo, you know, thank you, um, general obligation bonds. Uh, you know, the my understanding is that things that are able to be put forward as collateral, which is how we basically did the the ballpark, DPAC, the police station, those were all limited, limited obligation bonds, which we can do internally, right? Those are not putting it in front of voters. Um, so I think having been on the council, we've had several conversations around infrastructure bonds and knowing, you know, our climate satisfaction survey, especially around roads and sidewalks that consistently gets put as the, the you know, there's lots of other things in there, but that the entire time I've been on council, and I think before that, roads and sidewalks is always where we see some of our deepest resident dissatisfaction. And so to meet that need, I think it's going to take something like this and probably as we've discussed several rounds of this. Um, so I am supportive if you're looking for a, a thumbs up to move us forward. I am, you know, eager to hear from other colleagues, but I definitely, my thumb is up. And then with the park side, um, I think that those those parks are um, transformative for our community. All three of those parks will be in, in areas that have historically not been invested in at the same level. Uh, we've heard from a lot of community members around pools specifically for many, many years. Uh, it is actually a public health crisis. We have a very high percentage of, of children who drown in our community because we don't have enough public pools. Uh, so I think that that plays out in many, many ways. Um, we can have long conversations about why we have those numbers in, in Durham around uh, public, public schools specifically. So I think it does actually address the equity question because these are publicly held places, unlike many of our other features that we have done, uh, limited obligation bonds are. You have to pay to go see the um, baseball game. You have to pay to go see a show at DPAC. You don't have to go, you're not gonna have to pay to use the pool. I mean, you're gonna have a much lower cost to that. You're gonna have a much lower cost to a lot of the amenities in the park. And that's something um, that I think is really, really important. So uh, I, I am supporting this. Thank you. Council Member Cook. That was um, Council Member Caballero actually touched on one of my questions, which are, I, of course there's gonna be continued costs after this, 80, I'm looking specifically at the Parks and Recreation one, after the 85 million originally, are we gonna have, what are we looking already at? Like, would there be costs associated with using the those recreational spaces? And, and what would that look like? Yeah, there would there would be programming cost, certainly with any new park and those, those types of facilities. And so those would just, you know, those discussions have been, uh, you know, just with the department and, and the budget department. And so there would be those operating costs. And so those are being built in those forecasts. Um, but and, it, but it, it would be absorbed through the, the operating budget process um, in would, future Would any years. of that get passed on? Like, is there going to be a charge for accessing those spaces for community members? Uh, I'm assuming we don't have those. So I, I can answer that very briefly. Um, in you know, in public park and recreation, um, there's certainly many services that are free uh, or open, and there are some that do have fees. Um, as whenever we have a fee on anything, uh, it comes to the Dur the Durham City Council uh, in a fee ordinance. 
So all of our parks and recreation fees are, are really set and approved by, by, the, by the council. And I would just also add that uh, because we do have an interest in making sure there's access, um, we have basically sliding uh, fee scales for much of uh, the activity that goes on in park and recreation. But I know that as a new council member, you probably have not actually seen a fee ordinance. So the fee ordinance that we have in place is one that was approved by the council the last time, but it is it is something that is a public um, you know, decision. And so that would automatically get it. We would definitely have a fee ordinance for these and their continued operating costs. Any anytime we have new, um, you know, new facilities or a new type of program that would uh, cause a fee to, you know, be added, we would have to update our fee ordinances to ensure, gi giving us the authority to charge fees. So that that is one portion of it. What we typically do when we are uh, building or investing in assets, we are estimating future costs for operations, and that is built. Those costs are built into our, our annual operating budget. So the staff, the full-time staff, the part-time staff, uh, our, our lifeguards, you know, every every managers of facilities, everything that would be needed, you don't see it here, but it would be um, applicable in the years that any of those assets were coming on online. Perfect. Um, thank you. So, and then I have just one more very brief question. Well, two. Um, Council Member Rist actually raised this in our March 1 meeting, and and I'm just, now that he's put it in my head, it's it's in my head when I'm looking at the designs, which is that, like, it looks like a third to almost a half of the space is being used for parking. Um, have y'all discussed potentially consolidating that into a garage stack situation? Sure. I think. As far as the renderings of the park and then parking lot and your call, that, that is just a rendering. Uh, so it may not be that exact footprint you see a parking space in. Probably have not completed a second parking lot. Okay. I mean, I know they're rendering, but I also remember you talking specifically about how there was tons of feedback on, like, having a deep pool, for example, for older kids to play basketball and these things that I know are getting incorporated. So those things are going to stay, I'm assuming, but right. there's going to be room for, for other modifications outside of right. those ones. Okay, great. All right. What you see in those renderings. Totally right, right. Of course, and I heard you say that design yeah. is part of the fee, so I, I understand that the design part is yet to come. Okay, and then I just, just for funsies, will you one more time tell us how expensive it is to build a mile of sidewalk? Might be a, oh, did he leave already? Oh no, here he is. <laughs> just, just one more time. Just for just for all of us to hear it. Sean Egan from Transportation again. Um, so we see a range um, of costs, um, and some of the costs that are in this presentation have increased about 15 to 20 percent uh, as part of an additional review that we did. Uh, right now, uh, we need we um, <clears throat> have the the internal staff resources to deliver the current level of sidewalk uh, projects. So for us to do additional uh, property acquisition and for us to do additional project management on top of our existing city staff, we would need those costs to be uh, included in the cost of the project. So the revised estimates uh, are higher than what you saw um, in on March 1st uh, because they include uh, the estimated cost for contracted services for property acquisition and contracted services for project management to deliver these projects. Uh, so if you do the math on it, uh, it's up to $9 million per mile for the 12 miles 
that you see here. Uh, some of that is because of the scale of the project. Some of these are very small uh, gaps, um, like the NC54 uh, um, is three tenths of a mile, um, but it's um, uh, over a million dollars. So uh, the larger, uh, the more we can uh, address economies of scale, uh, we're gonna see better uh, cost per mile, but we also are mindful of the impact that gaps in our network have. And we want to have a fully connected network and that NC54 project, for example, uh, that small wedge uh, at a cost per mile is very high, but uh, it gives us uh, um, a complete and connected sidewalk network. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think those are all my questions that I'm just gonna echo my council member um, who's just spoken. Um, the, both of these projects have my full support. Um, I'm up here talking a lot about affordable housing. Y'all know that I work in that all the time, but I do think that there is more to living in Durham than just surviving. And I wanna make sure that we are also creating a Durham where people can thrive and have leisure time and, and enjoy their space. Um, we have just moved up in our gardening zone for how hot it is. Uh, global warming is not a question. Um, it is hot out here and we really, really need public spaces where people can enjoy water and learn these really, really important skills such as swimming. Um, Council Member Caballero spoke to it, but um, though I'm sitting here talking about it as a leisure activity, it really is a survival need as well. Um, we have many, many, many more kids of color dying in swimming um, and drowning accidents than um, percentage across the city. Um, so there, there have to be opportunities for folks to learn how to interact and be around water, um, particularly as the climate continues to rise. And also we know that recreation spaces are vital for the community. So I am fully on board with that one. And I'm also gonna echo those sentiments before even I've been on council for three months, I've gotten uh, a, so many emails about sidewalks um, and that is totally valid because we deserve also to have a place where people can walk down the street safely, access our awesome bus system and all of these different things. So my full support on both of these projects and thank you all so much. Thank you for those comments. I totally agree. I uh, graduated from NCCU, it was a requirement to learn how to swim. And uh, that's what motivated me to get my instructor's license. So who knows, I might teach a class this summer. That'd be fun. Um, any other comments? Council member. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And thanks, Council member Cook for those comments. Appreciate that. Um, I had two money questions and two sort of street solver questions. So the, on the money question, so I understand how you, that you base the um, calculations on debt calculated at 5.34%. That's what you've had to do, I guess, by statute or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you'd probably model this at some point for if we, Assuming we have lower debt costs yes. based on our AAA bond rating, how does that change that? I think you said the average rate over the debt term was like two point five. So I, I, I think you would see like the 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 high range that twenty the peak at twenty million dollars of debt service. I think that uh, if I remember correctly, it comes down to like maybe more like sixteen or seventeen million dollars, and so uh, there's there's a considerable difference between the two. If we if we get a lower yeah yeah, yeah. and I'm just yeah. I'm just showing that one peak here um, I could I I'm more than happy to to share the information I don't have it you know at my fingertips but it is it is less interest yeah. cost and some curious that we'll, oh, it's my screen here. if you did calculate the the average rate over the debt term how does because you you showed them two dollars fifty one cents over the the term right how does it change that average cost so it. I don't know exactly, but it would it would probably be more like closer to two, not two point five cents. Oh, yeah, significant. Yeah, appreciate that. Second question is we we've talked a, we've been talking a lot. We talk a lot about over time how costs increase, right? Mm -hmm. We just had this conversation about housing stuff. So so what's the process either you were at the department level for budgeting? Because I know we got the first tranche coming in whatever couple of years, and another tranche a couple of years after that. So obviously, this over time we're doing all this work. So what's the process been for estimating cost increase over time? Is it simply like uh, estimating inflation or like, how do you, how do you calculate that? So, how, so that we don't come back four years from now and say like, oh my gosh, we don't have enough money because we want to do this, but the costs have gone up. So how do we, how can we be assured that you're modeling to make sure cost increases are built into this whole model? So for like the new sidewalk projects, we built in those numbers. We will notice a noticeable increase from when we met in March to today. 
we built in those uh, escalation prices into that model, hoping, assuming that we can get these done in, you know, a, a, a two to four or five year time period. And so, so we estimated on the higher end, the, the parks, I'm not sure if you noticed it was $75 million uh, in uh, at the retreat, we're now at $85 million. So we are factoring in a lot of that. And I mean, that's a pretty- I'm pretty sure last year when we got the presentation initially from Parks and Rec, it was like 55 million, so. Right, right. so so I, I believe it's it's a combination of our adding a, a, a factor on there, working with the consultants, say, hey, what what is what do we think this is gonna be? And you're right now we're even, it, we, for the the two parks, uh, while you have the the concept renderings, you don't actually have the the designs, uh, the, the actual design and or the bidding of the project. And so, you know, there may have to be some value engineering that goes along. So it's hopeful that in this process that what we are presenting today is the upper end uh, to cover all of those costs. I appreciate that. It's better. It's better to know on the front end to be, you know, clear about that than sort of later get the sticker shot because it's going up. So right. I appreciate your work on that. So two questions about, or maybe kind of one just larger question about the about the unpaved roads and the um, the supplemental street paving. So I noticed under the unpaved roads that we're just talking about the roads. There's no other. There's no sidewalks. There's no other improvements. I'd love to see us because we talk a lot about well, we have these roads and like we got to we, now we got to try to build sidewalks because we you know. So is there not a way that we can build in or what would it look like to build in sidewalks as well? So we're not in the same place again, five years from now, oh, we need sidewalks. We got to do additional work and like right away. So, so can we do that? And I, was, I know there's a cost, right? But so there was a cost associated with that, that, that. I think there was an, if I'm not mistaken, and a city manager page could probably help me with that. There was a study that was done. And I think the original intent was just at that time was just to pave the roads, not to provide any of the curbs um, and, and that addition. I, certainly it, anything and everything can be done. It all just comes at a cost. And this was, I think, um, the most cost-effective way to at least get them paved. Yeah. That, uh, that, was, uh, yeah. that was like when you presented, it was like $119 billion or something. <laughs> Someone like, may have presented that. It was not me. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was, yeah, that, that was... We have enough street on roads to go from Durham to Dallas. I remember that. That was me. Mm -hmm. It was you. So, to answer your question, back in 2019, Sorry. The direction was that we would go forward as a department and just pave all the roads, no other improvements. If the desire is to now change that, it will switch from just a paving project to actual full road construction project, which is going to be substantially more than what we gave to finance as far as estimates. Um, and that will really vary depending on each street, depending on how much right away we have, utilities that would need to be addressed, driveways, drainage. It's a much different type project, but a much higher cost. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. It just feels like, you know, it's sort of, we're just kicking that can down the road then. So, you know, in the future, we're like, hey, we don't have sidewalks, we need to build sidewalks. So, I, so I, again, I understand there's limited costs, but that, I just want to raise that question. I'm like, yeah, so that's one. The other question I want to raise was, um, there's been a lot of talk about like what our standards are for building roads, right? And this is, I guess this is in the UDO, is that where that is? It's so, in the UDO, but it's also within our reference guide for development within Public Works. And we work with the transportation department as well with de developing those standards for road, new road construction. So, so, and what were the, what were the, like, what are the standards, what would those be for the new road construction? Is that? Well, it depends on if it's a residential or commercial, so it somewhat varies depending on what type of development is happening around the new road. So I'm not sure I'm understanding your specific question as far as. Yeah, no, no, and I'm kind of fumbling with this, but I know that we, like we just talked earlier about, you know, narrow lane widths means like traffic calming, right? So like, what are we building? Wider roads? Are we building roads that are going to be more traffic calming? What are the, I guess the question is, what are the, I mean, I guess you said that the standards we have, but I'm just want to make sure that what we're building is building for the future, not sort of, you know, yeah, so, I mean, with a typical residential street, you'll have roughly 12-foot wide lanes. You may have a two- to four-foot wide shoulder in addition and a sidewalk that's built anywhere from five feet to, I think in some cases now we're going with 10-foot wide multi-use pathways. So 
you can actually narrow that road just with uh, some of the traffic calming measures that transportation has. That's pavement marking, striping, different things like that. Doesn't necessarily mean changing the width of the roadway itself, but but what, just change the configuration. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that's why I guess I'm just hoping we build, have that complete street sort of notion. They were utilizing that as we're building these new roads. That's I guess my yes. request. Yeah. Yes, we do. Well, again, I, th I think this is exciting stuff. Um, I appreciate the work staff has done and, and look forward to this. I'll be supporting this. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you uh, for all the work staff. So in I, I was here in 2019. I remember the discussion. I, I I was a council member who said that, um, you know, there, there are cities in this country where you can literally go across the tracks and see the historic uh, vestiges of, of disinvestment. So a lot of the conversation about paving the roads was about equity. And, and one of the things um, I remember saying was that, you know, one of the thresholds that in order to be truly considered a great metropolis, you have to cross two of the thresholds. One is you have to be accessible without a car. And two, in a city, every road should be paved um, at some point. So, so that was part of the impetus of, of, of that discussion, kind of bringing us up to, uh, in light of historic, inequities to at least a baseline some of these areas where where these roads are they will be just roads um you know folk were having problems traversing them um with their cars so so i'm glad to see this in this project with that said i, I do i want to do a little commercial about our AAA bond rating because some people think we're too protective of it there's kind of poo poo on that AAA bond rating but but the the financial health of the city and strength of the city is the reason why we're in a position to do some of the other things we do without having to raise taxes whether it's expanding heart or guaranteed income, uh, you know, and, and to demystify our job, I always invite people, you know, to to just think about how you run your own household. Think about what a good credit rating allows you to do for your own family, how it allows you to project your income beyond what it currently is when you have a good job history and a credit rating. So, so it's the same thing for the city. Think of the city as your house. Um, the same rules that apply for your credit score apply for ours as well. And it allows us a lot more agility and power to do things. So I'm not debt averse, but when we talk about floating debt as a city, the checklist we go through, for example, if we talk about some of these projects being expedited, one of the questions I had is how expedited? Um, how many years are we moving forward on certain things uh, as a, relative to what we would get just going to straight CIP? And how do we value those increased years? You know, if it's two years ahead of schedule or 12 years ahead of schedule, and how do we value that? So those are some of the questions that inform uh, my decision um, on this, which I am supporting, by the way. I, I do want to, uh, some of the framing and, and funding options, where it says no referendum will have impact on multiple CIP projects that will either be delayed or not funded. I, I'm, 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 struggled, I'm struggling a little bit with the framing because insofar as the CIP is aspirational and strategic, you know, there's always the opportunity for you know, delay or not being funded. That's the case because it kind of reads like we knew we were going to do this bond and we and we have to pass. It, it's almost framed like, you know, before we had this bond discussion, we didn't know we were going to have the bond discussion, but we still had a CIP. So I, I don't want to create for, for listeners and for our residents that, you know, this is a fait accompli that if we don't do it, you know, it's like a, a bad decision. Um, you know, when we talk about project delays and escalation costs associated with rising labor and material costs. That is never not true. Um, as a matter of fact, we have rising costs every year in the city because we give our folk raises every year on our step plan. Um, as the city grows, we're going to have to buy more fire engines. We're going to have to hire more folks. So rising costs is, is always a case, whether we do a bond or not. That's just the reality of, of the, uh, if you're growing. Now, we wouldn't have these problems if we weren't a growing city. And then we said, we don't need any more sidewalks because we don't have any more people moving here if we were stagnant. So I, I don't want to create the impression, you're not doing this. I'm just saying for those watching this, listening to this discussion, that this bond somehow will, will inoculate us or address things that are always the case anyway, whether we're going to do a bond or not. Um, and those are the decisions we have, you know, we have to make. Um, sometimes when you look at your debt situation, perhaps adding a penny or whatever half cent to the CIP, which I think we elected to do with the sustainability and the, uh, the uh, equitable um, fund, as opposed to a bond at that time, relative to the whole picture, sometimes might be the best way to go. 
um, even taking into account rising costs, which are always rising. Uh, that's built into the picture. Um, so I say that uh, to say that the 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 money, uh, the floating of debt uh, in this in these particular instances, I think is is worthwhile. But I, I don't want to suggest to folk that we have to do this or else because of these situations, which are always the situations. We're going to have higher costs, not only in, in with relative to this, but our operational costs literally go up each year uh, because of personnel and things. So we're always dealing with rising costs um, unless we're not growing. So that the cure for that is just shut Durham down or say no more people uh, can come. Um, and we're not going to do that. So I'm excited about the project. You know, as I said, I, I have a sentimental connection to paving all of our roads. Um, I do. Uh, I'm glad Councilmember Freeman brought up the, the equity uh, issue, and I know that that's a lens that we're applying. Um, you know, I don't want to see expedited projects, expedited uh, um, delivery on projects that haven't been vetted through our equity lens, because historically that's been the problem. Things have been expedited in certain neighborhoods and not in other neighborhoods. Um, so thank you uh, for all the work. I, other than, you know, addressing that framing thing and, and the importance of protecting our AAA a bond rating. Anytime we float debt, we have to think about that capacity where we will not be able to use that in other areas. Uh, but I think these projects meet the test of of being worth uh, while floating debt. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues, for your great comments. Thank you, Councilmember Baker. Thank you. Um, got a question uh, looking at the sidewalk projects. Um, some of them have federal funding attached to them. I'm just wondering if we were to not fund them, um, would we lose that federal funding in, in for those specific projects, or would that or would that funding be reallocated? I will let Director Egan address that one. So we're under very significant scrutiny through. Uh, the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO process, which is where we've gotten the awards of federal funding that you see for the sidewalks. Uh, we've had recent meetings, um, Council Members Rist and Caballero have been there, where their colleagues are asking, why is the city uh, holding on to this funding for projects that the city is not delivering? Um, and there are timelines associated with delivery of these projects. And the longer that we wait without delivering the projects, uh, the greater that risk is that the MPO can uh, invoke those deadlines and recall uh, that federal funding. So the the longer we wait, uh, the greater that risk is that we could lose that federal funding. That's good to know. Um, and and some of these projects are in NCDOT right of way as well. Um, it, did we go to NCDOT and say, this is your right of way, you need to build us a sidewalk? Um, uh, we work in partnership uh, with NCDOT. Uh, NCDOT uh, has a an approach what they call betterments. Um, so if we want to improve, uh, make better uh, a state roadway, uh, they look to um, the local government, the municipal government, to sponsor the cost of a betterment. Um, there's been there's some discussion about. A complete streets policy and uh but uh we so far our experience has been uh that where we where we request betterments whether that's a sidewalk or other improvement to the roadway uh, they look to the uh, municipality to to cover that cost okay one one last question um as far as uh our investments um would there is there any additional potential matching are there any potential matching grants out there that would give us more bang for the buck here? So we are applying for um, some uh, funding through the, D the DCHC MPO process, but that's for uh, trails projects. So the projects that you see here in the bond uh, uh, are not uh, projects where that was requested. Uh, there are always competitive opportunities, uh, but we have many needs. And so we have a priority framework um, for those competitive opportunities. Uh, one of the, the biggest opportunities that we have ahead of us is the federal Safe Streets for All program. Uh, so uh, they have a billion dollars available uh, each year through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Right now, we are not uh, qualified to apply for that capital funding through that project. Uh, 
Uh, we need to make some changes to our Vision Zero policy, and we need to have a Vision Zero action plan before we would be an eligible applicant for that funding. So we are working diligently to uh, bring forward those updates so that when that cycle opens up again next year, uh, that we can be uh, an eligible applicant and uh, we're currently ineligible. Okay, we think we can make those updates in time for, for next year? Yeah, okay. uh, very soon. Okay, thank you. Um, I, it, it's, it's always, uh, we always wanna do things, uh, especially things that we need to do, like constructing sidewalks, um, paving roads, and building parks because they're all necessary um, and they have a, a cost, a high cost associated with them. Um, I am also supportive of uh, of this path that's being presented to us and, and putting it in front of the voters so that they can make a decision. Um, and I, I think I think it's important stuff, important infrastructure um, for, for us to be investing in. Um, I also appreciate uh, the points that were raised uh, by other council members uh, about complete streets and and uh, when we pave when we build new streets and pave streets and construct sidewalks that it is part of a uh, complete cross section um, that uh, that moves uh, multiple different users as as safely as possible and in accordance with with best practices. Um, and also I'll just say, you know, I, I, I think this, this shows and, and, uh, council member cook brought up the, the cost of sidewalk, just how important it is to capture incrementally when there is, um, development, um, capture that, that infrastructure at the time of development or reconstruction, um, uh, because that, that's an important part of, uh, being, being efficient, um, with, with our resources. So appreciate the work that's gone into this. Um, and I will give things back to the mayor here. If I could just add, I just want to say that I appreciate um, some of the comments of my colleagues. I do want to point out that I think it was myself and Councilmember Caballero who were trying to push for that Vision Zero coordinator for a number of years to make sure that we were ahead. And um, it's hard, hard hearing that we're now behind on that. And um, I do want to say that um, I, I wholeheartedly believe that we should do a referendum. I do want to make sure that it's the best referendum for the people considering the amount of money we're talking about. And I do think that it's important to figure out whether or not the complete streets can be factored into those paved roads. I do think that we're, wherever there's opportunity as well, um, we've got to figure out how to make sure that our MWBE um, resources are in place. And these are the type of things, these are the conversations that I like to see. And when I don't see them in the presentation, it makes me worry. Um, that the staff is not talking about it or engaged in some work behind the scenes that will make sure that that comes to the forefront. I am not, um, I'm not going to say I'm supportive, but I will say that I'm, I'm okay. I think with the housing bond, I had the same issues because there's things that we can do that actually make things better for more people in our community than, than just, um, contractors who come in from other states and other cities. Um, to cover what we need. And so I just want to make sure that we're not losing that piece of this in the equity conversation, just knowing like our, there are plenty of women-owned and minority-owned businesses who could be involved in this conversation, but if they're not even a thought in our conversation as we talk about a bond for uh, $85 million or $110 or $116 million, then I think it gets lost. And so I don't want to lose that. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I And <clears throat> just really quick, I, I know that these are projects that we're going to be delivering uh, if it goes through. So I, I, I to your concern, Councilmember Freeman, I, I would hope that the Office on Equity is included um, with it, um, considering that it will have to go through. It's like we're not outsourcing it. So we'll, well, some of it, yeah, but it'll have our standards. Well, yeah. I think it's important to note that there have been contracts that have come forward that said they couldn't find right. or they, yeah. they didn't yeah. meet. And so if we're not actively pursuing it, it kind of gets to the end and we're like, oh, we can't do it. And gotcha. that's all. No, that Mr. Mayor, if I might say, oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do want to, this, this particular discussion, and I do want to say in, in kind of defense of the staff that the, the equity lens in terms of the ranking of our projects is now part of our culture. 
And, and that's reflected in the listing of these. The contract, if I agree with Council Member Freeman, we, we need to maintain vigilance at the contractual stage when we're bringing in vendors. But this, what is before us now, is reflective of a, of a culture of equity and the staff does a great job in doing that. I just wanna celebrate them on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I would echo that yeah. as well. I think the staff does a great job and I think it's really helpful to make sure that we keep saying it as well. Yeah. So, Mr. Green. That's a beautiful moment. Oh. <laughs> we need that on a shirt. Um, <laughs> um, I just had a couple more questions. One is around like the tax increase because with the affordable housing bond, you know, essentially we're putting it in front of the voters. You get these things if you say yes, and yes means your taxes are going up. So the affordable housing bond, we delayed it because of the of the pandemic, and it was also just there wasn't the pressure. Uh, is there if if folks are seeing shifts? partly around interest rates, right? If, if folks are seeing shifts on the finance side, like, hey, we think they're gonna come down, will there be back to back to council like there was uh, with the affordable housing bond where it may not be to our benefit, um, you know, if we hold out for one more year, whenever we decide because of, of what's happening with broader economic. Um, so so I, I would say my response to that is we don't try to really time the market, but there are other opportunities. So once we issue debt, there's always, the option in the future to refund that debt and get for go for go for if the tax rates go down we refund it and then we we generate savings on on the on tail taxpayer. end yes. okay okay thank you that's what i want to make sure i want because we all know that part of this is is how we market this in a, in a couple months and then that's to my second point and this is really for our stakeholder community the process is staff gets us the projects, they do the, the, the legal and technical pieces, then it is up to uh, other folks, not staff, to promote. Staff cannot promote it. So this is for our stake. We can promote it as elected officials. We can we can do it. I just want to say for the affordable housing uh, bond, former Mayor Shul, there, there were yard signs and and calm strategies and all kinds of things. And so this is a this is a call out to our stakeholder communities who have come to us uh, for many years that it's going to have to be a lift outside of city staff to get approval in front of the voters in November 24. So I'm going ahead and stating that really loud and clear um, because uh, I think sometimes people forget that part when, when they come, when we want to bond. Well, staff can get you so far, but then if people want it, there has to be a different strategy in front of voters. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, this This is exciting. And and I, I'll I'll start with I, I'm glad to see that the convention center is not on there, because um, what was presented to us was without consideration of all of the public the private interest in supporting us on it. Um, so I personally wanted to put the need out there to make it very clear that every data point shows how badly we need a new convention center, but we just aren't ready for it yet. And I I prefer waiting until we get more support. Uh, to make sure this is a public-private partnership, uh, and then we'll take you know the appropriate steps at the appropriate time. Um, I I think many folks know how competitive I am. That's why I kept asking about the AAA uh, credit rating. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, tragically, you know, you saw just what happened in Baltimore. The city of Baltimore has a a, a double A credit rating, and it's making it much more difficult in their rebuilding of the Key Bridge. You know, um, it's going to cost the residents in the state more. Um, of course, the state is helping them out with that. But just that's just one example um, that, you know, how it pays off that we are in this situation. Also, there are only 30 cities, I believe, about 30 something cities out of 30,000 cities and towns across the nation that have a AAA credit bond rating that's identified by all three of the issuing agencies. And um, Durham is proudly one of those. Uh, so we we are in the best shape that we possibly can be. Uh, once we let's say this is passed in November, uh, if we you know put it on the ballot and it's actually passed, um, are the once it's set, I, and I'm glad that you just answered Councilmember Caballero's question around you know tax rate changes and changes of being able to refund. I was interested in that. But are there any other impacting factors that could uh, deter that could impact the actual calendar of the payoff? Like, or do we just set it and just follow it, no matter the population change or 
uh, rate. Are, are you talking specific to the tax rate or? So let's say we, we do 200 million. Mm -hmm. Our tax base expands. I don't know if these are related, but our, our tax base expands. We, in some perfect world, <laughs> we yeah. cover in our CIP and projects and, and more. Are we able to adjust? You know? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say the word fluid, but it is sort of fluid. And as we grow, our if our resources expand, our tax base expands, yes, we're able to make those adjustments. Okay, that's good um, to know. But through a, as information that we would provide to the public, we, there are some ballot requirements for transparency. And so we would have to follow those transparency requirements in, in informing the public um, from a staff perspective as to what that is. Um, but the reality is, is yes, as we grow, tax base grows, we make adjustments based upon uh, on the forecast. Gotcha. And current conditions. I, um, I, I'll just say quickly the reason why I'm supportive, you know, it, one is just the comfort and quality of life. Um, there is one store that a, a retail store, major retail store that I go, I can go to and, I've used this analogy before, but you get the carts and they're all, you know, bumpy or loose. They're this the lights in the store, just the dim fluorescent lights. And it's just, it doesn't feel good to be in there. But you go in there because it's it's a retail store that has a little bit of everything. Then there's another retail store that's similar to it, and the, the lighting is bright, and the carts, the suspension on the carts that you're pushing. It's just so much smoother. You go in the restroom, it has big mirrors, and it's like, you want to look in the mirror, like, oh, I look nice today. It's just a different quality experience. I look at our streets the same. You know, when I'm in New York, you better be careful, uh, Middleton, when you're, you're, you're uh, driving in New York and the amount of money you're going to spend in getting your car realigned or tires replaced. But, you know, um, you know. That's a new train. It's just, you know, uh, but imagine if our streets were were actually smooth to ride on, you know, it just makes you want to be here. Imagine if you could just park your car and just walk everywhere you wanted to go. You know, it makes you want to be here. Um, and so I, I just I think about it in that that instance. And the other I just look at the economic benefit of parks. Uh, and I keep going back to, you know, I, I'm finding myself calling Raleigh to Park City because they keep doing parking bond, park bonds every other year, you know, and and they're out doing us on parks. I'll give that up. All right. But not for long. Um, I think this is a really good start. And I also know that just through our CIP process, it takes forever to get anything done. And this is an opportunity for us to really invest in an area of our city that is desperately needed. I also know that when you um Invest in the parks. What comes with that is, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, a more building a community that's friendlier to our climate. You know, we're going to have trees out there. We're going to plant more trees. You know, um, we're going to, it's going to bring housing. It's going to bring investment. It's going to bring businesses around it. People are going to want to be around it. And I hope that we can focus more on revitalizing communities rather than just replacing communities, which would be displacement to folks that are there. Uh, so we have a chance to, get so many things right with this. And I look forward to being a, a, a big cheerleader on this um, as, as we move forward. So I, I'm excited about it. And, and it's, I can't wait to see kids out playing in the pool and learning how to swim uh, and having just another pool that we can get access to and where we're looking at having this one, we, we don't have anything over there. So this is, this is exciting. I'll be supporting it. Great. Well, thank you. I think I have clear direction uh, and I've, I believe you'll be seeing an agenda memo on this uh, in, in an upcoming cycle. Just one additional question. Sure. If, it, if it is at all possible, I, I was just noting that there was about 19 miles of unpaved roads. If it was possible to see a price tag on that for complete streets, that would be helpful. Okay. That was a 13.2 miles. I think 19 was the original. I think it's 13.3 left to pave. And then I think we've got two and a half miles that are on the, yeah, yeah. there's two and a half miles that are, I think, scheduled program for this summer to be taken care of. And so so the number is already shrinking, but you want the balance of what it would cost Pretty to much. finish it. Yes. 13.3.
Okay. Yep. And I, and I, I'm not pitching any specific company, but we do have a company right here in Durham that uh, they, they actually make concrete that is eco-friendly yep. and it's uh, much, it's much friendlier to our environment. So um, I, I hope that companies that will be taking on these contracts can consider that building, uh, utilizing bio-friendly uh, or eco-friendly uh, concrete. All right, can I get just an official thumbs up for direction if you are in favor of so giving the staff direction? All right, we have six and a half. All right. All right, thank you.